I don't know, we can go yellow. Uh, thank you, Jack. Um, if you can hear me, we'll come back to you with some questions at the end. Um, Chris, hopefully you can hear me too, and we'd like to, to move on to you next. We've obviously discussed a few societal implications so far of technology, but we haven't touched on accessibility yet. Um, <laughs> it's an issue close to your heart. So I wondered if you could introduce yourself and share your views on how, um, the IT industry has helped or helped <coughs> accessibility to, to date. Okay. Okay, I think I'm on. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so first, my apologies for not being there. Um, I was struck down with a particularly nasty um, <clears throat> virus over Christmas, which is actually worse than COVID when I caught that couple of years ago. So that's the bad news. Um, uh, going back, I think it was Jim mentioned the, the infamous IBM Christmas card, which was 40 years ago at Christmas, obviously. One of the, probably my first introduction to viruses on computers. <laughs> I did receive it, but I didn't catch it. I can't believe it was 40 years ago. <laughs> uh, just for the record, it was actually written by two German students who were on uh, a placement year at IBM. But, um, but I don't think they completed the year. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if we go back to benefits, I mean, building on the last speaker, um, I'm now able to join this thanks to the internet. Okay, um, I missed the physical contact, um, but uh, I can still participate. So a little bit about me. Um, I started in the industry back at the late 1960s. Uh, I've retired twice, and um, I've now redefined retirement as I no longer charge for my time. Um, <clears throat> and for the last few years, I've been focusing on um, people who have been left behind by technology, which is particularly worrying as more and more of just living depends on digital services, um, essential services or just broader services. Um, but there's a lot of people, probably around 20%, are left behind. Um, and for the last two years, I've been working with the Digital Poverty Alliance, who have quite a broad definition of digital poverty. And I realised that most people were focusing on poverty, which I refer to as affordability. People who can't afford devices or cannot afford to pay for broadband connectivity or any other form of connectivity. Um, and they're being left behind. So I thought, well, what can I do that's a bit different? Because uh, so many people are playing what I call eight-year-old soccer. They're all following the poverty ball and not maintaining position. So accessibility is part of our remit, um, digital accessibility. And I decided to focus on that. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is just give you some brief facts which I hope will worry people. So if I'm just, just looking at the UK, I'll be a bit parochial. <clears throat> I was just this year, uh, every year the DWP publish statistics on people who are registered disabled. So this year, the number rose to 16 million with a registered disability, be that physical or mental okay um uh so that'll be republished around the march time for a march april time frame <clears throat> now um focusing on just the web aspects of digital accessibility there's, there's an organization i've been working with in the us called web aim and they perform a um uh, a service to uh evaluate um, websites, specifically home pages, against the 
W3C accessibility guidelines. Um, and they, they assess a million websites per annum. And there's, about, there's at least 96% have non conformance issues on their home page. These guidelines produced by W3C were produced initially in 1999. Uh, and one of the key instigators um, was our oh, mind block. Um, who invented the, the web? So, uh, oh, God, it will come to me. But I mean, they came out in 1999, the guidelines. Now, during the last week, what what have we seen all over the media about 1999? Just to set context, it is when um, the first issues with Horizon IT came to the surface. And then all of a sudden, they're all over the place uh, because of a drama, um, a dramatisation of the issue. Not because of all the other correct channels, but accessibility of the web specifically has been um, eh, known since the 1990s. And yet, as I said, 96% of websites have errors non-conformance areas. So it's the same sort of time frame, but unfortunately it's not getting the same level of uh, attention anywhere. Uh, and something else that surprised me is, um, well, this is both a UK and a global statement, is public sector websites uh, are generally in better shape for accessibility than the private sector. Yeah. Um, and why? Uh, I think it's down to, in the UK and the US, to uh, regulation. In the UK, the relevant regulation is called PS Bar, uh, and it was introduced in 2018. Um, now, I'd love to give you a little anecdote here. Uh, so I live uh, just off Exmoor in Devon, and our village has, in common with most villages, has a, a parish website. Our parish website maintain uh, the webmistress is somebody, she's in her 70s, doesn't have an IT background, and yet while walking around Exmoor on a hike about 18 months ago, I was talking to her, and what impressed me is she was completely clued up on digital accessibility. Why? Because the district council that hosts and provide the facilities for the website, government regulations reached all the way down to them, to her, a volunteer. So when we looked at the parish website, we found quite a lot of errors. Uh, and they were all to do with contrast. Contrast being... Um, the most prolific of all the error types. Um, just poor colour. And in our village case, it was green and white, which is a very common one, especially with um, organisations uh, pushing the sustainability agenda. Green is a sustainable colour. <laughs> Pale green on white is a disaster for many people. And although there's 16 million people disabled in the UK, people who suffer from colour blindness are not, yeah. in, not included. It's not a disability, it's an, it's an impairment. Uh, there's 3 million people with colour blindness in the UK, 300 million worldwide. And by the way, there's 1.3 billion disabled people in the world just to set the size of the problem in context. Um, but further along, I'm, I am not trying to solve the technical problem here. I don't believe this is a technical problem. There are very good technologies available to provide uh, better, more accessible digital services, be they on the web or be they through 
smart devices. <clears throat> There's lots of technology, very impressive technology. The, last, the biggest problem to me is a lack of organizational awareness. Um, organizations I've approached, I think they fall into two camps. One, that they just don't understand. They just don't know. And I put them in something, I'll, a term I've borrowed from elsewhere. I think they're guilty of unconscious bias. Then there's some organizations who I approach directly and I and they choose to do nothing, which I think is inexcusable. And that, I believe, is their conscious bias. Uh, they're taking a decision. And I think it comes down to, within their budget for IT programs, they, prefer, they place a higher priority on functionality over inclusivity. They choose digital um, <clears throat> discrimination to give it a strongest term uh, because they want more and more function. But it's interesting that when IT projects go wrong, it's rarely do they get publicity for functional failure. And I'll come back to Horizon. My understanding of it is it's the non-functional aspects of Horizon, things like, you know, in, um, unable to complete a financial transaction due to an internet, a, a network connectivity problem. That's probably it's not a functional problem. That's a non-functional problem uh, that could be should have been programmed around. So that's it, I guess. Why are we ignoring the this? You know, a quarter of our population. Why are we ignoring them with poor digital accessibility? Thanks. Yeah. Good.